one of our biggest challenges is the fact that we operate across multiple markets mm -hmm. with multiple regulations, um, with how you deal with this medical product, uh, multiple languages, multiple ways of, of um, uh, having to hire and keep staff. And so for yeah. us, it's been really uh, almost a game of growth and localization at the same time. Hello and welcome to a new Hello Master podcast. My name is Louise. I'm the founder of Hello Mass and we bring this podcast together with Frank Watching. In this episode, we're talking to Sean Perron, who is the marketing director of Ace and Tate. And for those who don't know Ace and Tate, it's a Dutch scale up uh, that is currently operating in 10 European markets and they're really disrupting the eyewear sector. They call themselves the first online glass brand. Um, and the difference between Ace and Tate and the traditional eyewear brands are huge. Uh, the pricing is different, the transparency, and also their omni-channel strategy. They started online, but yet they have 70 stores, um, and it's really becoming a well-known player in the retail sector. Ace and Tate started seven years ago. They're currently active in 10 markets, and they employ over 700 people. And it's the first fashion brand on Hello Masters podcast. I even got dressed up for this one. So today we're talking to the director of marketing at Ace and Tate, Sean Perron. And although he was born in the US, he is very much a man of the world and lived and worked in five countries. Uh, his reputation as a marketing and brand leader in fashion led him to the role at Ace and Tate. Um, Sean started out in Japan. He was working there as a model, an actor, and a news reporter. Um, he later joined a British eyewear brand to grow their Japanese market. So from Japan all the way to Europe, um, Sean finished his MBA and then worked for Diesel and started at the branding department at Adidas. Three years later, he moved to G-Star, another fashion brand where he joined as a global brand director. In 2019, he joined Ace Tate to head up the marketing department and growth. So some fun facts about Sean, he speaks fluent Japanese and he's on board of the Dutch Fencing Association. So in this Hello Masters, Sean and I talk about his team, omni-channel strategy and fashion marketing. Don't forget to subscribe to Hello Masters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or YouTube. In two weeks' time, we dive into B2B marketing and talk to the marketing strategist at Exact, the well-known accounting software. Now, let's get right into the episode with Ace and Tate's Sean Perron. Happy listening. So welcome viewers and listeners to a brand new Hello Masters podcast. And today we have a very interesting marketing lead uh, into our, um, you know, well, virtual studio, I would say. Uh, we have uh, Sean Perron, um, who hails originally from the US, but I think it's fair to say that you're truly, uh, you know, a global world citizen that has been calling Amsterdam f home for, I think, the last five years. That's right. Yes. Good morning. Yeah. Well, welcome. How are things for you? Yeah, things are great. Uh, sun is shining here in Amsterdam, as you know, so yeah. I can't complain about that. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you here on the, on the Friday morning. And um, so before we hit off and, and go very deep into Ace and Tate and how this, uh, you know, very quickly became an iconic brand in, in eyewear in the Netherlands, I would love to actually um, do a little test with you because uh, mm -hmm. I have two reading glasses here. All right, let's go into it. And yes. they uh, look fairly similar. Uh, one is, f you know, for me, the other one is for my wife. Um, you know, we kind of have a similar eyewear taste, I guess. Very good. Um, but they're not from the same store. One of them, you know, uh, is from Ace and Tate, and the other one is not. So I'm just going to put them on, and then you should guess which one is from Ace and Tate. Oh, man, this is going to be tough. I know. So this is the first yeah. one. Okay. I'm just going to turn around so you yeah. can have a good look. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to try this one on. That one's Ace and Tate. Okay, bingo. You know your product. Thank so this God, is a great good. start, you know, for a marketer yes. because you have to know your product, right? Otherwise you can't sell it. So big score, mm -hmm. Shane. So yeah, we, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're into it, right? <laughs> Nicely. So, um, yeah, so tell me a little bit about your journey. What brought you to Amsterdam? What brought you to uh, Ace and Tate? 
Yeah, very good indeed, like you said, and thank you for the, the nice introduction. Um, I originally hail from the US and I've been here in the Netherlands since about 2015, but um, mm -hmm. indeed, more or less since I graduated university a long, long time ago, I left the US and have traveled and moved in different places. Mm -hmm. um, and have been very lucky to be able to have different experiences and work in different organizations along the way. Mm -hmm. um, on the way, somehow, very randomly, but very interestingly, the eyewear kind of always followed me. Mm. I wear eyewear and I'm fairly blind without it. Um, and funny enough, one of the side jobs that I had when I was in university was to work in an eyewear shop. Mm. Um, this was in London, 2001, 2002. And lo and behold, six years later, seven years later, I was representing that brand in Asia and building their marketing and sales there completely coincidentally almost. Yeah. And then lo and behold, here we are, you know, another 10 years later and here I am with another eyewear brand. So in some ways, I guess I have to say that I, I wouldn't, I never thought that eyewear was going to be something that was going to stay with me forever, <laughs> but somehow in my career, it's kind of always come back. And um, when uh, I had the opportunity to join Ace and Tate uh, about uh, just a little bit under two years ago, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity because again, you know, coming from eyewear is great, but also the business model is so fundamentally different than how traditional opticians work, how other eyewear brands have worked in the past. So it's also been a great place for me to, let's say, hone my marketing skills and to dive into a different opportunity. Yeah, sounds awesome. And you kind of have a background where you not only lived in five countries, but you also, um, you know, finished your MBA and, and you worked for a lot of fashion brands, right? Um, so this yeah, it's, um, I, I think, how do I say this? Like, I, I, I've always had a little bit of, um, an interest in taste, not so much in fashion, but I suppose more on the design and the creative side of things. So my undergraduate was also in creative writing and I've always been kind of leaning towards the the area of self-expression. And I was really quite interested with uh, with design and clothing design for quite a long time. And of course, eyewear is also another design piece. It's about self-expression. And that's kind of followed me um, along my uh, along my career in different ways, mm -hmm. but I'm not a creative. You know, I, I know that I cannot draw. My writing is, you know, good enough, but not great. Mm -hmm. um, but I like working with creative people. Mm -hmm. I like um, helping them bring their ideas to life. You know, I get really excited about connecting ideas with people outside. And I think that the the industry of, let's say, fashion design is a great is a great place for that because you are just able to work and uh, be surrounded by very talented individuals. Yeah, for sure. So what are the things that you enjoy doing when you're not working? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's also an interesting question. You know, in many ways, I think today, like work really bring, like takes over your lives, right? And mm -hmm. I have to say, especially uh, the last year or so with, uh, with COVID, it's quite easy just to kind of keep working and keep working, keep working. And mm -hmm. I have to, in a way, find things that kind of force me out of my work state. Mm -hmm. So I really, really try now more than ever to really turn off work and do things that take me to very different places. So, of course, like um, I think a lot of us are doing right now, and it's kind of boring, but it's still very true. I love going for walks. <laughs> so here in, in, in Amsterdam, as you know, we have a big uh, we have a, a big kind of forest, Amsterdam Sebos, which I don't live too far from. So mm -hmm. I like to go for long walks there. And I like to read. Um, I read a lot of fiction, a lot of history. I try to do as many things as possible that has very little to do with the day to day of work. Yeah. Because I find somehow for me that really helps me come back fresh. Yeah. And and finding that balance is definitely an important part. Yeah. So do you have a favorite book you could recently read that you can recommend to the favorite listeners? Book. Let's see here. I um, I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, I think he's a pretty well-known writer, Japanese um, uh, fiction writer called um, Haruki Murakami. Mm -hmm. He's wrote uh, quite a lot of um, like postmodern fiction books. He's got a great book um, I can definitely recommend. So his books are a little bit strange. Let's start there. And uh, let's say an acquired taste. So mm -hmm. the deeper you go, the better it gets. But if you haven't read anything from uh, Murakami before, I can definitely read um, when I, what I talk about when I talk about running. Oh, yes. So he's an avid runner. Yeah, I know that one. Um, he does like ultra marathons and, and he explains how almost the meditative process of running allows him to become a better writer and the balance between those things. That's a fantastic book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, cool. 
Um, so I'd love to um, just ask you a bunch of uh, rapid fire questions. So, Ooh, okay. you know, I showed you mine, uh, Ace and Tate classes. So um, yeah. you wear one yourself, but do you have a whole coll uh, collection? Like kind of how do you decide what air wear to I wear to wear yourself? Yeah, I have quite a lot of glasses. And uh, the fun thing about eyewear in general is that it lasts very long. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a strange thing to say, but especially like in the world of fashion where things change all the time. Um, and especially in the world of fast fashion where even just things don't last as long. Mm -hmm. Eyewear can last for a very long time. So I, I quite like having just a few key styles that kind of stay with you and that you can wear with anything so i'm wearing what we what's called the robert i'll kind of lean in mm -hmm. and see it here nice um and for quite a long time i wore frames actually similar to what you just showed so mm -hmm. that's made from what we call acetate which is a, a, a polymer mm -hmm. um that has a little bit more of a crystal feel to it mm -hmm. and uh when i started working at ACT, i tried on uh, metal which i'm quite mm -hmm. enjoying right now so these are quite nice they're just round frames but a little bit of a little bit of a I guess, uh, like a square shape here. Yeah. Um, made in titanium. Mm. Uh, and they're quite nice. Very and cool. um, these ones have inside them what we call uh, a blue light filter. Yes. And that blocks out the blue light that's emitted from screens, which for me is quite helpful since probably like you and a lot of people watching and listening, I spend yeah. a lot of time on screen. Exactly. Yeah. And it does help, particularly when you work in the evening to kind of you sleep a little bit better when you wear those uh, lights on. Cool. Definitely. So, so as a marketer, kind of what is your, your favorite marketing tool um, or just favorite tool to work with on a, on a day to day basis? I think if the team heard this, they kind of laugh. But right now, I am obsessed with Trello. Oh, <laughs> me too. I love Are you it. for real? Really? Yes. It's such a great way to keep control of what's happening and still, you know, build an autonomous team. But why do you love it? You just said it precisely. I okay. think. Um, I am definitely a person built for human interaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the last year or so has been quite tough for myself and for our teams to find ways, exactly like you said, to help keep people working autonomously, but also just to connect people. And we have been kind of just casually using Trello for quite a long time. And it was about, I think, last summer when I, maybe when we first spoke, I was really spending a lot of time researching agile marketing and talking mm -hmm. to the developers and the, um, uh, the uh, IT uh, department, our team, kind of understanding how they work because they work so well remotely. Yeah. And um, we just dove into it. And, and now I love it because I know we're, everyone in the team is working on things, but I'm able to kind of just look and see where we are and know if mm -hmm. we're on track or not. And this is my obsession. So every morning I just wake up, open up the old Trello, <laughs> see what's going on. Cool. Very nice. Yeah. So if you um, kind of look at favorite marketing channels, maybe um, from a business perspective, and then maybe we can answer the social media channels, maybe from a professional perspective. But, um, you know, what marketing channels do you really enjoy um, working with? Yeah, it's funny, like, um, maybe this isn't as much from, well, actually, no, there's definitely a business connection to it. So I, I guess I like the things you can't have. And um, <laughs> I really, really miss the IRL channels in real life channels. I think especially around um, before COVID really started kicking off, I, you saw in general yeah. a big shift in marketing to go back to actual human experiences. So whether that's events, activations, you even had in the U.S. kind of big like consumer focused conferences happening. Yeah. And I think there was really good reason for that. I think there was really a there's something to be gained from actually having direct interaction with your customers and letting them interact with each other. Yeah. Um, as a business, we have so many stores as well, and they were great tools for us to get feedback. Mm -hmm. And I miss that. Um, yeah. uh, and I also think our customers miss that as well. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and if you kind of look into social, I mean, there's you know obviously a lot to do about social when it kind of became up and running in uh, you know 2013, 14. It was still the channel where you know people had high expectations, you know, for the betterment of society. And I think you know after the last couple of years, we've we've seen the dark side of it as well. Um, so what is kind of your own usage in, in social media? Well, I think like from a business perspective, we use, of course, I think the class of social media channels um, that you see a, a lot of other players in our space are using. And for us, definitely Instagram is still an important one. Mm -hmm. It's evolved over the last year to, to become a place which is less of a 
just a place for us to um, deliver branded communications, but actually to have conversations and um, an interaction with our community. Mm -hmm. So we are doing things more now like um, answering questions about eye health, about um, giving people tips of how to stay balanced and healthy when they're using the screens all day. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm, I'm quite happy to see that shift mm -hmm. where it's becoming a conversational tool. Um, the other one for me, which is quite interesting, I don't know if it's really, it doesn't, I guess it's kind of a social media channel, but it's, it's also a bit of a commercial platform is Depop. I don't know if you're familiar with Depop. No. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's an app that came, it's been out for a couple of years now that started in the UK, which is a, it's actually a consumer focused resale app. So it's a place where you can go in and when you're finished wearing clothing, you can basically create a nice little, um, a, a nice little profile and sell your used clothing to other people. Ah. And I quite like that because I, I, a, there's real beautiful creation happening on that platform yeah. by individuals, not by brands, where they're almost kind of building their own little shop, which oh. is quite fun. And also, uh, in the world where we have so many things, it's quite nice to see a place where we are giving products a second life. Yes, for sure. Uh, yeah. So that one's quite nice. Nice. Oh, that's a great yeah. tip. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Ace and Tate. And I think you just answered the question secretly, but, but I, I was kind of wondering who's Ace and who's Tate. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So it's acetate, yes. um, which is the the material for which um, a good portion of our products are made from. Mm -hmm. um, it's a classic eyewear material made from originally. It comes. It's a polymer that's developed from plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why it's so well used in the eyewear industry is because it has both flexibility, mm -hmm. which is really important because you have to shape eyewear to your face. Mm -hmm. um, but also the way that it's built, you can actually create a lot of different interesting colors and dynamics. And over the years, um, that has really um, progressed. And we're at the place now where we're also able to do a lot more things sustainably with it, which is quite nice. Yeah. So okay. um, we're developing now and working with what we call bioacetate. Mm -hmm. which is acetate that doesn't really contain any sort of individual or additional plastic polymers inside of it mm -hmm. so that it can actually be um, um, uh, composted over time. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So how would you explain the success of, of, of Ace and Tate? I mean, the, the, maybe you can take us quickly through the journey of, of how the company started. Hello, Louise here. The Hello Master podcast is powered by Hello Mass and Frank Watching. So recently we launched a new tool, the Hello Mass Playbook. With the Hello Mass Playbook, you build your marketing action plan in 10 minutes. Fill in your marketing goals and our algorithm builds your marketing playbook. And the best thing, it's free and there are no strings attached. So go to hellomass.com slash playbook. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's interesting for me as well to talk about this because I still consider myself fairly new to the game. So mm -hmm. uh, I have to give a lot of credit to all the individuals that have been part of Ace and Tate to, to bring us to this point in this journey. And of course, to mm -hmm. um, the founder of Ace and Tate, Mark DeLong, was a brilliant guy who, of course, had the idea in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, let's say, first of all, in the if we take a step back and we look at the eyewear um, industry holistically, and we were speaking about this a little bit before, mm -hmm. it's a very old school industry and, and in many ways for good reason. So on the one side, Eyewear indeed is a is a fashion item, but on the other side, it's also a medical device. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have the same thing, but I certainly cannot see without my eyewear, and it is the case for a lot of people. So it's also mm -hmm. regu regulated medically. But what you saw over time um, is that you had a lot of big players really dominating the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say dominating the industry, I mean dominating the value chain. So. Um, really controlling materials, uh, controlling supply and production of eyewear, and then controlling uh, the sell through of that. And mm -hmm. that results for the customer in many places in, um, in transparency, why you're paying mm -hmm. this price for a product. Um, this, I think, was a little bit of the idea that kind of sparked uh, our, our founder, Mark, to start Ace and Tape mm -hmm. uh, several years ago. And essentially what we tried to do is take the intransparency out of the eyewear pro process, mm -hmm. right? So it's about um, coming in and saying, listen, like if we are not adding all these additional uh, bells and whistles to it, if we're not having to sell our product through a third party, we can offer just as good of quality as any of the other high-end eyewear brands, because it's for the most part coming through this, you know, very similar or same supply chain, but mm -hmm. at a better price. Yeah. And I think what's quite interesting about this is that 
in that process, especially as we've evolved from being online and now also much more omni-channel and also in store as well, is yeah. we can really control the customer experience. Mm -hmm. We can invest yeah. a lot of time there to make sure that the customers actually feel cared for and uh, are felt and are known when they come into the shop. Yeah. So that business model is quite interesting, but I think what's helped Ace and Tate stand out even from the competitor set because that as a model isn't necessarily um, groundbreaking or alone to Ace and Tate. There's a little bit of let's call it like like the 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 brand aesthetic. Mm -hmm. you know, we try we we call ourselves the the eyewear brand for Gen Y and Gen Z. Mm -hmm. And it's our mission to become, hopefully, one day, the number one eyewear brand for Gen Y and Gen Z, if we uh, mm -hmm. keep working hard. And that means filling the experience with the aesthetic that we know that this customer would like. Yeah, There's a creative energy in the brand, which I think has really helped it to fuel over time. And so we're, we're always in this flux of inserting and finding ways to give this kind of surprising brand aesthetic, mm -hmm. but also make sure that we really understand the customer experience and we're really able to give the customer the best experience that they can get from any optician. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, for taking us through this journey of indeed starting as an online first brand uh, and now having, I think, about 70 stores. Um, That's so right. what was the key, maybe one inside of, um, you know, moving first online and then into clicks and bricks, because it's definitely a different operating model with more fixed cost. Uh, I guess right now, all, having all these stores is, is not going to be great on your balance sheet. Um, so, so how are you kind of navigating that space? Yeah, well, it is a product you put on your face <laughs> and it's a product you wear every day. So um, for many customers, you want to try it on. Mm -hmm. This is understandable. But again, I think the other important thing to remember is it is a medical device. Mm -hmm. So effectively, you need to get your eyes tested to yeah. be able to wear glasses. Mm -hmm. And you really, 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 really should get your eyes tested about usually around 18, uh, every 18 months, two years or so, you should have your eyes tested. So in a way, it became a very natural growth opportunity for us to move from really becoming, being a, a pure play on, um, online um organization where the customer has to do this somewhere else so we mm -hmm. don't have any information we can't control the experience we know what's happening and then they have to try and um, uh, try glasses online or order at home but they mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the ability to try the whole collection or to get feedback from people or to talk to an optician yeah, and this right. is when we started to make the shift offline but for me what's been really interesting and i think if i look at say my um uh, my career in marketing what I've really enjoyed about working at Ace and Tate is that the online mentality is applied to retail, mm -hmm. whereas in other places, what I've observed working with other organizations or talking with colleagues is that typically the retailer mentality is applied online. Yeah, that's a very big difference. Yeah, it's, it's a very different. Yeah. So what this yeah. means is really using data and insight to understand customer experience and find ways to enhance it. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, has been a, one of the big tools for the success of, of Ace and Tate. And what we've been able to do with that is just be able to grow that and, and um, expand connection points with the brand by expanding through, uh, through offline growth. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, you obviously know, uh, particularly as a, a, a person hailing from the U.S., uh, you know, Warby Parker, which uh, sure. you know, started this revolution in uh, online, um, you know, online first uh, eyewear and much more as a fashion brand. So how much did Ace and Tate copy from, from Warby Parker and just implemented it locally here in the Netherlands very well? Well, I think Warby Parker happened around, two, what they started, what, 2010, 2010 2011? Yeah, yeah. Um, and incidentally, like, more or less a similar time when Mark actually started the business model. And I think mm -hmm. he kind of came to the similar, if you were to talk to Mark, he would tell you that he had a, a bit of a, a similar situation as the founders where he was shopping, I think it was even in the U.S., in New York at the time. Um, at a at an hour brand and kind of walked in, wind a pair of glasses, and walked out like with four hundred dollars out of his uh, out of his pocket, not really sure what just happened. Yeah. And and I, that inspiration is really where the brand started from. Mm -hmm. I think we've grown um, over the same period together, mm -hmm. and um, I think you know overall Warby does a fantastic job of really creating a great customer experience in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But we've kind of moved in our own way. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the experience itself, let's say the, the, the aesthetic and the energies of the brands are quite different. Mm -hmm. And I think also we've just had different challenges as organizations. Mm -hmm. One of our biggest challenges is the fact that we operate across multiple markets. 
-hmm. with multiple regulations, um, with how you deal with this medical product, uh, multiple languages, multiple ways of, of um, uh, having to hire and keep staff. And so for yeah. us, it's been really uh, almost a game of growth and localization at the same time. Yeah. Challenging. And um, I, I think there's a lot of credit that can also be given, um, especially to uh, the retail department here at Ace and Tate for being able to overcome that because that as a startup is quite a is, is quite a challenge. Yeah. What are your key markets that you operate outside of the Netherlands? So uh, Germany is a big one for us, mm -hmm. um, as I think it is for a lot of players here in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. The UK has also been traditionally a, a great market for us, as well as okay. Belgium as well. Mm -hmm. um, those are some of our larger markets. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a lot of great growth recently in the Nordics as well. Mm -hmm. And when was I think end of 2019, we also moved into Spain. So we uh, entered into our first Mediter uh, Mediterranean country. And there we've got two stores right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your role. So you're heading up marketing and, you know, we talked to a lot of CMOs and, you know, marketing tended to be uh, re really much, uh, you know, brand building and, and campaign, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And now it's turned into full-fledged strategic board level uh, functions. Um, so it can be very broad and very narrow. So, so share a little bit about your scope. Yes, indeed, you're right about this. It, it feels like the, the, the role of the marketeer basically evolves or changes every three to four years, right? Yes. Um, yeah, very good. So uh, my current role at, uh, at Ace and Tape basically encompasses, how do we say it? So on one side of the things, like the very classic um, growth, acquisition, retention functions that you see for the most part is, is, is consistent with, with marketing everywhere. So how are we um, acquiring new customers? How are we uh, retaining those customers? And what's the opportunity there? Mm -hmm. um, the other side of that is indeed the brand building element as well. So for us uh, at Ace and Tate, we, we are in very in many ways a, a values-driven brand. There's things that mm -hmm. we really care about as an organization. We want the world to know about. We want our customers to, uh, to know about. So spend a lot of time and a lot of my day to day really uh, working with the founder, with our creative directors about how to bring that to life. Mm -hmm. And then the final element is um, uh, being able to articulate to our customers the services and the products that we have. So working very close with the retail teams, with our customer experience teams, the customer service teams, to make sure that all the all the information that is that needs to be communicated to our customers is done in a, in a uh, clear, direct, understandable way. Yeah. Are you also responsible for the e-commerce revenue or do you have a peer for that? Uh, we have a peer for that. So yeah. we're, we look at in marketing actually bringing customers onto the platform. Yeah. Um, and then there's, I have a peer who's responsible for actually converting those, the customers that we bring on board and well, yeah. bringing the traffic and turning them into customers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So basically responsible for all the way from, you know, cre creating awareness down to uh, delivery, marketing, qualified leads. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And then of course, yeah. retaining those afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Not unimportant. Um, so you can learn, um, you know, a lot from your successes and also for your failures. Um, so can you share you know, some one success at Ace and Tate in the two years you've been there that you're very proud of. Wow, that's a good question. I so I think one of the things that I'm I'm proud of the brand I'm proud to be a part about is um, the endeavor that Ace and Tate's made started doing I think it was around 2018 to really invest in sustainability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a passion of mine for, for pretty much um, my entire career and I was really proud to, to join the organization in doing that. And one of the product projects that we delivered last year, despite COVID, was a project called Reframe, mm -hmm. which basically allows customers to be able to bring their products back in store. We recycle them uh, where possible and in many cases it is very possible. We can re refurbish those frames, make them great quality and then mm -hmm. resell them to um, to another owner. So we're basically creating circularity mm. with our product. Oh, that's great. It's a it's little bit like what Patagonia did also with, um, with, with warm repairing water. stuff. Yeah, Indeed. okay. And, cool. and in a way, that's also where, uh, where Depop came into play. So we have, yeah. uh, we, we've built a, a, a nice channel on Depop where we're able to also offer those frames, um, basically great quality secondhand frames uh, and, and find them a new owner. Um, and oh. that's that's quite nice to be able to start to build circularity into the mix. So that's something yeah. I'm, I'm quite proud of as well. Interesting. And, uh, you know, you also learn from um, from your challenges or maybe even failures or fuck ups. Uh, we always have a fuck up Friday in our team, for instance, and it's not. I that... wish only one day a week was fuck up week Friday, right? That'd be nice. <laughs> well, it's OK. You can talk about every, but only one fuck up you can bring from the entire week. That's but, a nice um, one. I might, I might have to borrow that. 
yeah, it's actually really cool for the team. It builds, you know, kind of a laugh about, you know, things, sometimes things just fuck up, you know, and that's okay. Um, but it's actually creating a safe space to talk about it and maybe have a laugh. And, uh, you know, it's a good way to, uh, to balance it off with all the focus on creating wins, you know. Mm. Um, but anyway, is there something, a learning that, that you had in your, uh, your time there that you thought, oh, in retrospective, I would have done that differently, for instance? Well, so many, geez. I, like it's, um, so on the strategic side of things, and uh, I, I, I find this quite interesting, going across my career, I've been very lucky to work in different sizes of organizations. So uh, working in, for example, at Adidas and their global strategy team is a, is a much bigger beast. And previous then I also worked at, at G-Star on the brand side, which is a very large retailer, but, but not, let's say, at the level of Adidas where you have mm. ba basically individual corporations in every single market. Yeah. Then coming into to Ace and Tate, which is in the process of transitioning from that startup to really that scaled phase. And one of the things that, um, as a marketeer, if you if you want to make those transitions into different marketing business models, that you have to kind of learn is to, to really be very surgical and understanding which tactics you can bring with you as mm -hmm. you make that transition, yes. uh, and which ones you have to basically learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, like many startups and many scale-ups, we're also very ambitious at Ace and Tave, right? We, we want to grow. We want to uh, deliver our product to a wider set of customers. And when uh, first starting, for me, like I, you know, I really wanted to inject into Ace and Tate a lot of the bigger um, awareness tools that I've seen work in larger organizations. But the reality is for us is that we're, we're at a phase where we're still having to make an investment step by step. So, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a, a large organizations, maybe you can just toss a ton of money at this at an organization. But when you're in a startup, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to think really about taking little tools and little baby steps. And that's something that took me a little while to adjust. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something I really enjoy learning. Yeah, it's definitely true that there's a lot of difference in your operating model as a marketing lead in uh, you know a corp more corporate well-structured environment versus the nimbleness and the agility that you need to um, embody yeah and the sure. flexibility there uh, and i think oh, it's yeah. it's um especially when you coming if your experience is in brand building and um, mm -hmm. there is let's say like a a, a i don't want to call it a classical way of doing brand building in large organizations but there's the the brand is a big moving machine mm -hmm. um, that takes big actions. And as yeah. you come into smaller organizations that still have brand aspirations, you have to start to learn that actually brand can be done in very big ways, but also in very small tactical ways. Like yeah. random example, probably for us, I would argue at Ace and Tate, our most effective marketing channel to date has been our tote bags, right? Mm. It's, yes. it's so funny, like if, if I was working at Adidas, I would not even be thinking about this. <laughs> no. But these tote bags, they're beautiful organic cotton tote bags. You see them all over the streets here mm -hmm. um, in Amsterdam and Berlin and London have been fantastic tools for this. So when we open new stores, we'll, do, we'll work mm -hmm. with a local designer. We'll, we'll make a limited edition tote bag. We'll give them to customers. Yep. Customers love them. We see more and more in, in our, uh, in our uh, customer surveys that peer-to-peer -peer recommendation is a huge driver for people to hear about us. And we know they're an important tool for us. It's very interesting. Actually, you it bring is, me right? back to um, to the Web Summit in Lisbon. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I was there, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, a year ago or two years ago, I forget. But anyway, pre-COVID. And uh, there was a PVH had a, a huge booth there with all their innovation and digital stuff. Uh, but next to it, there was also, um, you know, a print shop where you can get, uh, you know, a high, cla a high um, uh, quality tote bag that you could personalize and the line was just enormous and this was a tech conference with all these you, you know lots of kiki cool stuff that you can do and uh, yeah i just think the, the the tacit nature of having just something feasible that is also personalized uh, uh, you know goes a long way so yeah 100%. great story yeah 100 yeah. and also um the more you work in marketing the easier it is to actually forget what it is to be a non-marketeer, if this makes yes. sense. Yes, <laughs> yeah. You probably have this too. Like you cannot help but look at social media through the lens of marketing strategy, but this is not mm -hmm. how most individuals, non-marketeers view it. Yeah, most people true. don't go to shops thinking about this customer experience. They're there to mm -hmm. buy something. Yeah. And a tote bag is a fantastic example of this. Like very few people care about your big, crazy ad campaign and very few people probably even saw it 
unless yeah. they're in your consideration set in the first place. Mm -hmm. But this is a product that's actually valuable for them and is fun. Yeah. And the I think the more you move into the startup and scale space as a marketeer, the more you have to really remember the simple things are often the most effective thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. Um, so in the last kind of 10 minutes, I would love to talk a little bit about your team and then sure. um, maybe a couple of things around what's happening now in COVID with some campaigns, maybe, or some channels. Um, so can you share, um, you know, a little bit about your team? How big is it? What skills, um, you know, your culture? So we are, how do I say this the right way? So the, in, in the, um, uh, in, in, in the space of being a startup and scale up, like the, the teams are always constantly evolving and we're always mm. tweaking with the right function. Right now, um, our marketing department and our internal creative team mm. kind of now surfacing as, as one organization. So we're a bit of a marketing creative, I call us the crocketing team. So that's why the <laughs> copywriters don't let me in their meetings anymore. Um, but nonetheless, like um, this has also been the result, I think of over the last, over the last year working with Trello, kind of needing to help people really work with each other virtually because you can't go over and talk to somebody. You can't mm. walk upstairs and meet the other departments. So you kind of have to really um, find systems and tools to help people really feel like one team. Yep. So within that, um, within that department, of course, we have the, let's say the, the growth parts of the organization that's focusing on performance growth, um, retention, that's an important part for us. Mm -hmm. We have a part of the organization that is looking at the retail experience and making sure that the customer journey is optimized and we're able to do uh, great campaign storytelling when possible in the stores that are open and utilize our storefronts as marketing communication tools. We have a core uh, marketing strategy team that's thinking about that content, how do we bring that to life? And we have a communications department that is geared on looking at our community through social media and how we leverage them and how we have um, conversations with them, but mm -hmm. also how um, we develop those conversations and expand them into earned media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We heard from, um, you know, another Dutch scale up, a very big one that, um, you know, they just only focus on content and PR, also earned mm. uh, and owned. Uh, and they try to kind of uh, take, you know, get off the, you know, the ad tech uh, crack, so to speak. Mm. Um, what is kind of your view on that? Yeah, it, this, it's, it's the place where I think you're going to see a lot of disruption in the, left, in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. precisely because of how people are actually responding to the, the, the over adding of, uh, of, of digital media. Mm -hmm. One place for us, I have to say, within the digital landscape that has been very successful and I and I, we spend a lot of time on is on more of the demand based side of things. So particularly mm -hmm. in search, um, because there's an, we again, especially in the medical service side of things, mm -hmm. we have to create awareness for our brand within this this space. But mm -hmm. the needs base is already there. People need glasses. People yeah. are concerned about their eye health. People are actively serving for that. And we have tools, services, products, and actually that can really help people. So we spend a lot of time really looking in that space and understanding how we can be there when mm -hmm. customers are looking for us, if this makes sense. Mm -hmm. yep. The other side of that is exactly like you said, I think for a lot of organizations, it's of course a very expensive place to play in when you're in the world of, of uh, auction-based media. And so we do indeed spend a, a lot of our effort looking at earned media, developing relationships um, with journalists and finding ways to get our message out in places that are authenticated by other professionals and other experts. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hello, Louise here from Hello Mass. So how do you arrange your marketing operations? Do you build everything in-house? Do you outsource everything to an agency or maybe even multiple agencies? We have a new solution for you. It's called the Hello Mass Flex Team. We create a team of marketing experts that fit your company and culture. They work freelance and on demand, and they think along with your strategy and provide extra execution power when you need it. Go to hellomass.com slash flex team and build your flex team today. Can you share a little bit of what's coming down the pike in 2021? Yeah. Um, a couple of things. So one, one is that there is definitely a shift that's happened through COVID that will not change. 
over that time, what we've seen with our customers, and I think I mentioned this a little bit more, is there's much more awareness, particularly for eye health, because we spend so much time on our screens. We, we get a lot of this anecdotal feedback from our opticians. Mm. We have professional opticians in each one of our 70 stores. And we listen to the, to the questions that customers come in with eye tests. And so many people are asking us about the effect of screen time on your eyes. Mm. Um, and we see there an opportunity for us to leverage our, our products, our services, our skill set to help our customers. Um, yeah. We're also this year, which I think is going to be exciting for us, looking to expand to new products and new categories. Um, so we will be launching in about the middle of March um, also Ace and Take contact lenses, which is pretty exciting. Mm. So uh, we're starting first with being able to offer that to um, our existing customers. And we're mm -hmm. looking to be able to expand that to wider customers throughout the year. And what's well. your differentiation with, because it's not like you can't differentiate on the quality of your, uh, you know, your, your glasses and um, uh, the fashion element is probably a bit challenging there in, on the product side. So how can you kind of differentiate there? Well, we know a majority of our, uh, our customers are already wearing contact lenses. So mm -hmm. it might be like, for example, in, in my case where I wear them for sport. Um, or it might be that, like many customers, that we like to switch in between. But what mm -hmm. we see right now is that um, it's, as a customer, you're basically going to one place to buy your glasses and go to some place else to buy your contacts. And there's mm -hmm. still a lot of intransparency built into that product as well. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so we're, we're effectively doing something very similar to what we've been doing with eyewear, which is building contacts directly with the supplier to be mm -hmm. able to create and um, provide high quality contact lenses as good as anything else. Yep. Actually, we're working with one of the best suppliers in the world at um, a better quality to price ratio. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier for you because you can come to Ace and Tate and we can help you basically understand your eye and help um, solve any eye problems you have and keep your eyes healthy and happy. Yeah, so it makes sense. Hopefully our customers will like that. Yeah, okay. Well, stay tuned for that coming down in, in March. So I want to wrap up with uh, you know some questions from our listeners. Uh, we oh, always yeah. post... Um, you know that we're recording these ahead of time so uh, people that follow us on LinkedIn and, and Facebook uh, can submit some questions. So we got two cool. good ones. Cool. Um, so Sander Hogedorn asked, um, and I think you explained it a little bit, but it might be nice just to answer his question uh, succinctly in one line maybe. Um, what is the secret to building the Ace and Tate brand? There, so honestly, like, it's hard it's work. Tough. Oh my yeah. God. It's just, it's like, I think this is the thing about brand building that it's also hard to understand because it's very um, ethereal, but it's about deciding upfront what the values are. What do you care about? Mm -hmm. So Ace and Tate, we say three things we care about. We care about, uh, about creative, creativity, inspiration. So we love working with creatives. We care about sustainability and trying is to reduce our impact um, on the environment. And we care about delivering a great customer service experience. Those three things. And okay. basically, when you have those in place, y your job is to find all the ways to activate those things within the guardrails that keep you true to your art and keep mm -hmm. executing and keep executing and keep executing. So yeah. unfortunately, it's it's hard work. <laughs> it is, and multifaceted. You know? Yeah, totally. well, thanks for sharing, but I think that trifecta of those three elements makes a lot of sense as kind of your, your framework. Um, so the last question we have from Frank Mineur, who asked, um, why is it that the eyewear industry can stunt with promotions like get three glasses and only pay for one? Yes, it, it has very much to do with what we spoke about earlier, which is about uh, intransparency in margin and margin and product quality effectively. So we don't offer those discounts because we believe that you should get the product, you should pay for the product at the right price for the right quality. Mm -hmm. If we were able to do that, like create like large, large discounts, yeah. basically what we're saying is that the other pricing model is not transparent. No, exactly. And you probably pay too much when you just pay uh, there you go. more. Rates. Yeah, for there sure. You go. Well, it was wonderful to talk to you, Sean. I think we covered a lot. We went really deep. We got to know you, uh, your passion, your company, your team, uh, and what's coming down the pike. So I really want to thank you and wish you well. I hope the thank stores you. can open uh, up again soon. So you can go uh, full 360 in your uh, customer journey. I hope so as well. Right. And hopefully we get to meet in person at that point as well. That would be so lovely because, uh, yeah, your store in the Neerstraat is very close to our office. So uh, oh, great. in case you're there, just uh, pop by and uh, we can grab a coffee or go for a walk. Now we're talking. Okay. Very good. Sounds great. Cool. Thank you so Thanks. much. Ciao.